You're listening to BioTalk with Rich Bendis, the only podcast focused on the biohealth capital region. Each episode, we'll talk to leaders in the industry to break down the biggest topics happening today in biohealth. Hi, this is Rich Bendis, your host of BioTalk. We're at the second annual Biohealth Capital Region Investor Conference, talking to companies and investors who are participating. We have a record number of companies, 108, and over 40 investors this year, and a number of them from outside the region. What we have now is a person who plays a dual role. He is an investor as well as a CEO of a company based right here in Gaithersburg, Maryland, right in the heart or the epicenter of the Biohealth Capital Region. I'm with Murat Kalialu. Kalialu. I do okay, Murat? Kalialu. Okay. Who's with Cartesian Therapeutics. That's really the company's name, but we'll find out about the investment side later. Murat, welcome to Biotalk. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. And it's nice that you were willing to come in, not knowing what this was all about, not knowing what you're going to be asked, and all of a sudden you're sitting in front of a mic talking to Rich Bendis on Biotalk, huh? This is one of my favorite things to do during the week. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. First of all, let's talk to the listeners about your background because you're both an MD, PhD, had a great academic career to get to where you became an entrepreneur and an investor. But let's give a little historical perspective on your background. Sure. As you mentioned, I started off doing one of these integrated NIH-sponsored MD, PhD programs at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. I grew up in Madison and I stayed there to complete the program. My PhD was on microbiology and immunology. And after I finished that, I went on to do a year of a transitional internship out in the Bay Area, and then went to Mass Ioneer at Harvard for a three-year ophthalmology residency. During that period of time, two important things happened. The first is that my program director, Tony Adamus, left a mass signer to go and start his own company. And I thought, well, you could do that. So that was the first eye opener. And the second was one of my classmates, Bonco, just dropped out of, of mass signer residency to go and get an MBA at Harvard. And again, I thought, well, you can do that? <laughs> I had no idea. Nobody told me that. Anyway, I didn't have the courage to stop in the middle of the residency. So I ended up finishing but then afterwards made a decision to not continue pursuing academic medicine and instead went and got an MBA at MIT Sloan, where I focused on entrepreneurship with the express intent of starting a company. So, and MIT Sloan is terrific like that. They had the 100K entrepreneurship competition, which we entered. We were a finalist in. They had a whole slew of uh, entrepreneurial classes. Ken Morse was my professor who started the Entrepreneurship Center. Lots of support. The Venture Mentoring Service over there, I was a part of that. So that, I would say, armed me. That experience armed me to go and have the confidence to start our first company, which was called Health Honors Corporation. What year was that? So that was in 2006. An important event. You could make the argument professionally, the most important event happened in my life by meeting during residency my friend and lifelong colleague, Mike Singer, who was also doing an MD, PhD, and also was in, doing his residency in ophthalmology. Mike had trained at Yale, had done his PhD in neuroscience, and landed at Mass Ioneer at the same time that I did. When we started our first company, Health Honors, he and I were the co-founders. Health Honors was founded on the idea that you could motivate people to remember to take their medications on time by paying them. So that's exactly what we did. We created an incentive system where if you took your medicine, you could report in that you did so by the internet or the phone. And every time you did, you would earn some unpredictable number of points, kind of like the lottery. So right. you had a possibility, but not the guarantee of earning points. So we created this whole intermittent reinforcement system. We tapped into a lot of behavioral economics and creating this technology platform. And we started selling into some customer bases that are regularly impacted by non-adherence to medications, namely pharmacy. So we had CVS as a client, health plans, so Kaiser Permanente as a client, and then pharmaceutical companies, AstraZeneca as a client. So where we are today. And where we are today. Right, exactly. Yeah. Look at that. And so we generated the data and sufficient to take that concept and really commercialize it and then sold it to a company called Healthways which is based out of Tennessee. It's a population health management company back in 2009. So we started that in 2006 and then sold that in 2009. 
And did you have external investors or was it all self-funded? No, we had raised $175,000 from friends and family. We were quickly running out and neither Mike nor I knew how to run a company. So we were fortunate enough to have John Sheehan, our largest investor and CEO, then come in and sort of teach us the ropes. So he came in and I basically said, just tell me what to do. And, and I just learned from him for several years. So John was instrumental in taking that idea and really sort of commercializing it. And that was a, just an eye-opening experience for both me and Mike. At that time, so in 2000... So it was a positive exit. Very much so. Very, Sorry, okay. I very apologize. Good. Yeah. We hadn't raised a lot of money, so right. it didn't have to be a huge dollar figure of an exit in order to be... Very positive. Very positive for investors. Good. Anyway, so then fast forward in 2009, we sold the company. I stayed on as a chief science officer for a year. And then in 2010, Mike and I started our second company. This one was based on an observation, Rich, that he and I had made in the clinic, along with a couple of other folks at Mass Ioneer, where we saw that some of the patients that were taking an approved drug called Zalatan to reduce the eye pressure for patients with glaucoma had an untoward side effect of fat reduction around the eye. So they basically had atrophy of fat. And so we thought, well- Does it work on all parts of the body? Well, so that was the idea. It's ah. like, well, why don't we just take this drop, reformulate it into a cream and apply it directly onto the skin of patients who have excess fat. For example, around the eye, which we call steatoblepher on the eye bags, or submentally under the chin, the double chin, or the belly, or in diseases like HIV lipodystrophy in the back of the neck, in the so-called buffalo hump. So we started off with that idea. So we took that company from concept to late-stage clinical trials, a phase 2B3 registration wow. study. We fully enrolled that study in 300 patients in five different sites across the United States, and that gathered some attention. And so Allergan came and bought us out in 2016. Wow. Okay. That was a little longer. You doubled your three years to six years, right? <laughs> Five and a half. How did you fund that company? <laughs> so we started off funding it through, again, our network of individual angel investors. And then a new investor came along. The name of that investor is Schooner Capital. So they are a private investment firm that was started in 1971 by someone who started Continental Cablevision, which became Comcast and separately Iron Mountain. So a terrific group of long-term investors that bet across stage and sector and bet on teams. And so we actually had met Schooner for health honors. Without getting into the details, it is an interesting story. We started health honors at their offices at Schooner, but they didn't invest in us back then because we were green. Right. But that relationship built and they apparently trusted us for the second time around. And so they became a major investor in Topokine Therapeutics. So that's the name of the second company. It looks like you say it was six years. You say you've been down in the region seven years. So somewhere with Topokine, you moved from Boston down to the biohealth capital region. So Topokine was a completely virtual Total operation. Virtual. Okay. So we started that company with the two of us me and Mike, and we ended up with the two of us five and a half years later. So we outsourced everything, and that made it possible for me to move down here for family reasons. Okay. Mike stayed up, and so we continued doing Topokine remotely. So you have this Boston Montgomery County connection, huh? Yeah, exactly. And it still exists today. Very much And so. that's going to be in a third chapter we get into here, right? Well, that's right. That's because right. you now have another company for with two positive exits. You go and say, hey, what do I do next? A week later, like literally a week later, we started Cartesian Therapeutics. And this is a cell and gene therapy that does chimeric engine receptor T-cell therapy, CAR-T therapies, with the naive idea that we could do Cartesian the same way that we did Topokine, virtually. So we thought, okay, we're going to go and build a cell and gene therapy in a completely virtual system. We're going to outsource everything. And we tried. It was touchingly naive. We ended up trying to do manufacturing by outsourcing it and quickly realized that for cell and gene therapy, the critical attribute, the core distinguishing factor is going to be the manufacturing. And so after some struggle outsourcing the clinical operations, outsourcing the manufacturing, outsourcing quality, we made a strategic decision to just build it all ourselves. 
So we partnered up with the folks at Shear Partners and Alexandria Real Estate at 704 Quince Orchard Road down the street from AstraZeneca here and built some state-of-the-art GMP manufacturing facilities and brought in the right people for a quality system, a GMP manufacturing capability, and also brought in clinical operations. So we now, fast forward three and a half years, we have three INDs open. We've treated over, I believe, 20 patients at this point, and we make our own drugs. So we invent our own stuff. We have our own preclinical effort. We have our own regulatory team in-house. We make our own product. We have our own quality system, and we have our own clinical trial operations folks. So it's really a one-stop shop. And we're only, I think, 18 of us. So we work hard, but we felt that strategically it made the most sense to ensure the success of this product, to iterate optimally. We felt that we had to have full control over GMP manufacturing, because that's really the name of the game in, in cell and gene therapy. One of the things I notice on your card is you're president and CEO of Cartesian, and you still have a partner, Mike, who's in Boston. That's right. He's a chief science officer. And he's a CSO. That's and right. And so it looks like Gaithersburg won on this one because the <laughs> headquarters is located in the biohealth capital region in Austin, Boston. That's right. You wouldn't know it by the number of times Mike visits here, but you're absolutely right. It's all about Gaithersburg here. And tell me why Gaithersburg won out over Boston when you decided to headquarter down here for a couple of reasons. So number one, we felt that just from a sort of a bird's eye view perspective, there was a saturation in the Boston market that would prevent us from building the one-stop shop in the middle of downtown Boston, even the suburbs relative to what was possible here. This relationship that we've built with ARE and Shear Partners, I just felt was just too good to pass up. I mean, the price per square foot was right. The support network was right. The staffing was much easier. And if you're looking at the regulatory side, you can get ex-FDA folks. If you're looking at the preclinical development side, you get folks from the NIH, from Hopkins. If you're looking at manufacturing, you've got ex-Lanza folks. So, I mean, the critical mass is here, and yet at the same time, you don't have oversaturation in a way that makes it incredibly competitive. So we've started populating our team. We've doubled in size every year for the last three years and you know, anticipate continuing to do so. It's really a terrific integration of a variety of different factors that allows us to be able to do what we need to do, to be able to have a really a one-stop shop in this area. And that's unique. Now, there's obviously other factors as to why we're here. I mean, this was something that I felt very strongly. We just needed to have me involved, like in a sort of a daily basis. And so obviously I was here and we recruited internationally. So we brought in somebody with an O1B visa as our third partner, our chief medical officer, Mithin, who had his own laboratory overseas, had his $3 million grant. And we basically just left all of that and came to join us as an oncologist, a physician scientist. And it was a relatively easy sell because he already trained at the NIH. He was familiar with the area. It was an appealing place for him. Well, I'm talking to Murat with Cartesian here based in Gaithersburg. And you're the poster child for the biohealth capital region, the company and you as an individual. You just talked about all of the attributes and assets that are here to build a company around. And you really don't lack for everything you've been trying to do from a manufacturing, regulatory, talent perspective, and probably not for money because you could probably fund this to a certain extent from yourself to start. So tell me, where are you now in that funding cycle did you take some of the proceeds from your first two deals, start this company with some of yourself, and then have you gone outside now to bring in external investors based on having 18 people in the company? So we first started funding this through reinvesting some of the proceeds from ourselves, but we also brought in all of our, we extended the invitation to all of our Topokine investors. As you probably know, in the first what was it, 60, 90 days upon a liquidity event that there are some tax advantages of rolling over your funds into the next venture. So we took advantage of that mechanism and funded it relatively early on with some of the same Topokine investors. We haven't yet taken on any new investors. We've done a couple of rounds of financing, but you really haven't brought in anybody new to date. At some point, it just given the dollars involved in building a cell and gene therapy company, I think that probably makes sense for us to do that. It also may probably make sense more strategically at some point, but we've really, and I think it's probably worth taking a step back and just discussing a little bit with our 
capital allocation philosophy, which is a little different relative to some of the other folks that you may talk with. We tend to be laser focused on the cost side of the equation. And the capital allocation is pretty much the 98% of what I see myself doing on a daily basis. And so we don't raise a lot of capital. And that's on purpose. It's to protect the shareholders. But it's also a philosophical consideration for us in that there's a certain respect that I feel one needs to have towards their investors' dollars. So I don't pay myself anything. I haven't paid myself anything for the last 12 years, I believe, over the course of three companies. And neither does Mike. And the reason for that is because we believe that the hard-earned capital the investor is putting is better used in the actual R&D effort itself as opposed to paying ourselves anything. Now, I don't have any problem with entrepreneurs paying themselves. That's fine. But it is something that I believe needs to be done with a certain amount of consideration. And ultimately, the less you raise, the more choice you have along the way. So if you've just taken on a $100 million round, the investors are not going to be happy if you go and sell your company for $95 million, whatever the valuation is going to be. But the flip side is if you've taken on $10 million, then you could wait for a billion dollar exit, but you could also do a $100 million exit or a $20 million exit. The optionality is there. And so we feel that as we build companies, taking less capital, not more, is the way to maintain that optionality over time. And then one of the things you just said was as we build companies, which means you're not done building companies. Because one of the other things and one of the reasons you're at the Biohealth Region Investment Conference is you're looking at other strategic investments that you and potentially Mike together as an investment team can make outside of Cartesian. Is that correct? This is it. Yeah. So I'm here today in my capacity as an individual investor. And Mike and I have gone through the list of the opportunities here. And by the way, they're terrific. All of them are just wonderful. Repeat that again. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the 108, though, that you had a chance, and you told me you looked at most of them. Oh, yeah. Just to look at the decks. All of them. All of them. Uh -huh. And out of that, what percentage of those did you feel were worthy of you at least meeting with, even though you know you didn't have the time to see them all? We selected 15. Nice. And then of those, you know, I'm trying to meet with about seven today. Right. Well, that's great. That's good news for people to hear that there's quality deal flow here in the biohealth capital region. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's insane. I mean, you would never know it unless you actually come and see what's happening. It's so important to do that. And it's interesting. I mean, I've met with a one person shop, the first meeting to a company that has gone through multiple rounds of financing and are sort of way into their clinical development. So it's not just a single hype of company. When you went from 108 to 15 to 7, what is the criteria that made you decide on these final seven? You don't need to name the companies. Is there any common threads amongst those seven that you saw that were interesting to you? Yes. So there's a couple of things we look at more than others. I think most investors look for an opportunity that is similar in philosophy to theirs. And it's no different for us in the sense that we tend to look for teams that look at capital with a certain degree of deference that we do. So folks that are not looking to raise 20 million when they could do the same task with five and really be able to justify exactly how that capital that they are looking to raise is going to be deployed and really have thought about it and have thought about it carefully and are not just asking and raising capital for the sake of raising it. That's so important for us. The second is, I mean, everybody says the team, but what specifically is it about the team? We look for a degree of humility, and I think we share this parameter with our folks at Schooner Capital as well. We look for a certain drive and ambition and a willingness to do whatever it takes to be the chief cook and bottle washer and just not be afraid to do it. And that comes through a number of conversations. We really spend a lot of time with the team. And then finally, and again, this is a, a philosophy that we share with Schooner as well, is that we look for an unfair advantage. It's something that is going to differentiate themselves in what will ultimately be a highly competitive environment, whether they're the only guy doing what they're doing and will eventually encounter competition because they're successful or because it's a naturally competitive area they're going after 
to begin with. So I would say that those are the three criteria. Mike, by the way, is a patent agent and in essence is our patent attorney. He writes all of our IP. So we do take a very close look at intellectual property. And then you mentioned Schooner a lot. You said you're here as an individual. Are you here as an individual angel or also with Mike as a partner potentially in which you may co-invest? Or are all you representing Schooner if you find something that would be interesting to them at the same time? So I am not here representing Schooner. Okay. I am here in my capacity as an individual investor. It is true that the dozen or so investments that Mike and I have made over the last three or so years, that a fair number of them have been co-investments with Schooner. But just like Mike and I don't have a formal relationship, Schooner and we also don't have a formal relationship. I think you just blew away the listeners' minds because you've done two successful exits. You're in a third company that's at a very important stage. And you just said you did 12 investments as an individual over this time frame, probably from your second exit or from your first exit, really? From the second, yeah. From 2009. So over the last 10 years, you've done 12 investments created two companies. No, no, from 2016. From 2016, you've done 12 investments. Right. That's even more impressive. How do you do that? How do you manage your company day to day and then have a portfolio of 12 early stage companies that all need the same kind of help and growth? I depend on Mike a lot (laughs) for the diligence. And it's just fun. Look, they're really two sides of the same coin. I learned so much about management from investing. And I learned so much about investing from management. So it's really, they're tied together and there really are two sides of the same coin. So which one do you enjoy the most? Well, it depends on the day. Well, I understand (laughs) that. But if you had to do your day job full-time five years or 10 years from now, after you exit Cartesian, which you're going to do someday, and you still have this side portfolio over there, you going to do startup number four plus manage your portfolio, or are you going to get more involved in the portfolio side? So my family will have a strong say in that. And I certainly enjoy doing this, but it does take a toll on you. There is a certain amount of stress that's associated with both ends. And so Cartesian has been incredibly rewarding because the reason we got into it is because both Mike and I have family members with myeloma and we wanted to do something about it. The previous company of my wife was so embarrassed and when every time in a cocktail party, they'd ask me what I did and I'd say, oh, you know, I'm making topical cream to reduce fat. People loved it, but my wife's like, oh, (laughs) don't talk about that. So embarrassing. Now that we're actually curing patients, I mean, that's pretty cool. And very rewarding for me to be in this area. And I can't imagine not being in oncology moving forward for the rest of my career. It's just been so wonderful. The investment side, when you get into a venture, whether it's health honors or Topokine or now Cartesian, you don't know if it's going to end in one year, 10 years, or never. You have no idea. You're in it for the long haul. And so you'll do whatever it takes to make sure it's successful and the treatment gets to patients as quickly as possible. In the event that there is some type of liquidity event in the future for Cartesian, then the decision is going to be whether to do a fourth one or whether to focus more on the investments. And and frankly, like I said, it's going to be a a decision with the family. <laughs> other than boards, family members, or some other people you have to report to, correct? Exactly. Yes, much exactly. more important. <laughs> I have some ideas on some of those, but we'll talk offline about some of this investment <laughs> philosophy where we could probably do some collaboration based on some of the goals we have with biohealth innovation. So what is it that goes unsaid that we haven't talked about that listeners would like to know about your life, your perspective on this region? your outlook on the future. And I had JP Morgan and Wilson Sonsini and you had a, doing one of your investment meetings, but they were talking about over the next 15 to 18 months with the election cycle coming up and what's going on politically, what's it look like for companies raising money, making investments in money, what's it look like for drug pricing and everything around that. And how do you find some of these external factors that will influence some of your decision-making in the future? Yeah. So I try not to think about all of the macro stuff so much because everybody seems to have an idea. And yet ultimately, when you sort of look backwards and think about the number of times those ideas have actualized, it's really a 50-50 crapshoot in terms of timing, in terms... Clearly, it's always good to prepare yourself for the worst. You can hope for the best, prepare for the worst. And the best way to prepare for the worst is not to raise more capital, but to use the capital that you do raise more judiciously. 
to ensure that you grow organically and not just come to $100 million and just start spending it left and right and rack up a burn just because you have the money. Sort of like we were talking about today, some of those that have gotten $110 million in a Series A in this region. Well, this is it, exactly. I don't think that that's a mark of success. Mark of success is getting a treatment to patients, and it's a vehicle. And the vehicle needs to be managed with deference. The only thing I would disagree, though, is getting those kind of successes for our region does bring additional attention from investors who have never looked at us before. That's a good point. To look yeah. at people that might not be trying to raise $100 million, they might need a half a million to $5 million. So if we can get some of those new investors, of which we probably have 10 here at this conference who have never been into the biohealth capital region before, mm-hmm. And maybe they came because of a Thrive or an Arcelex or Viella, whatever that name was that attracted them. I don't care as long as they're looking at more companies here that have quality science and technology that can help cure patients and get products to market. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you're spot on with that. But anyway, I interrupted you. I think you're on a theme, preservation of capital, prioritization and focus. You're talking not like a president and a CEO, you're talking like a COO and a CFO because everybody would love to have that discipline for what you're talking about in these early stage companies where it's so precious to have that capital to work with. Execution and capital allocation are all there is to building a startup. And again, I mean, I'm not talking about running a multinational here. This is all there is. This is 98% of what I do on a daily basis. And I tell my folks at Cartesian, I say, this is not a job. Your career shouldn't be viewed from the lens of a nine-to-five job. This is a mission. We have patients here that are waiting to get what we have now demonstrated is potentially curative therapy. thing works. Why would you not treat this as a mission? We've been given a gift, and we have an obligation to do something with it. This is true for so many cell and gene therapies in particular and so many other therapies and life science in general, that all of us in this area, geographically and in biotech in particular, we have this obligation to think about our lives and our careers as more of a mission than a job. What a great message for entrepreneurs out there. And one of the things I don't want to do is I realize I'm taking time away because this was impulsive to get you in here to do this biotalk. But you probably have a number of other companies that you need to be talking to that need your capital. And I want you to go focus on them and apologize to them if I uh, took you away from somebody that you were going to have a meeting with. Well, I will say, Rich, I can't think of anyone else who has done more for the area than you. Your passion, your inspiration, your leadership is next to none. And I'm so glad that I had an opportunity to meet you here. I believe it was three or four years ago. Four years ago. ago. The day after we sold Topokan, we were just about, it was before we started Cartesian. And then you came into our old office in our old building. Yeah, right. I remember that. It's been terrific. It's amazing. So, you know, we're talking with Murat Kalayalu. How did I do? Perfect. That's amazing. Just like a Turk. Yeah, just like, (laughs) I thought we weren't going there, but just like a Turk. (laughs) Okay. With Cartesian Therapeutics as well, an individual investor and We're going to get Murat back talking to companies here at the second annual Biohealth Capital Investment Conference. This has been fantastic. And I think people didn't know much about Cartesian and Murat. So hopefully these listeners are going to understand what it takes and what kind of passion it is to build three successful companies. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Biotalk with Rich Bendis. 